What do you think of the machine? I think it's marvelous. Do you think it means... Well, I haven't talked about There's Always Vanilla very much uh, because it wasn't really mine. It was written by a friend of mine, and, um, you know, we had a lot of problems. It was our second was the second film after Night of the Living Dead, and it, we all had our own different views about how which way it should go and how it should, what it should be. So it was not, you know, it wasn't really a fun experience that way. And... Um, but I loved working with the cast, and you know, it was it was a real learning experience. But you know, trying to do something that wasn't non-horror, and um, it, it it just was not. I don't think of it as a really complete film. Somehow. I'm afraid of you, Michael. Please let me go. After Night of the Living Dead, I didn't want to make another horror film right away. I just didn't want to get typecast that way. Uh, you know, eventually it happened, and um, you know, and I, I love the genre, and I have no regrets about any of that. But I, at, uh, just initially, I didn't want to do it. We shot a little. It was basically it was a it was a, uh, a promo, a, a screen test film for Ray Lane, and that's really what There's Always Vanilla wound up being based on. We shot this little half-hour thing that Rudy Ritchie wrote, and um, um, it was you know its own entity, its own little film. And in some ways, I still think it's better. I wish I knew where that film was. In some ways, I think it's better than the resulting feature. Because it, was, it, it wasn't pretending to be something that it wasn't, you know. But um, we were influenced at, you know, at the time by films like Goodbye Columbus. And, you know, there were small independent movies that were coming out that were, you know, I guess you could call romantic comedies. I don't know how to categorize it even. Bittersweet little romance things. So we said, well, maybe we can do Night of the Living Dead again with a di in a different genre. And that's really what it was about. So uh, we asked Rudy to expand the, the script for this audition piece that we had done. And that's where the film came from. <laughs> hey. Everyone from Light and Image was involved in this film. I mean, our comp it was our you know, company project. We never were able, we didn't have the money or the time to do exactly what we wanted to do with it, and we wound up having to do all those narrations with Ray Lane to just sort of knit the thing together. What would you ever want to do a thing like that for? You know what I mean. You know what I mean? So it was, you know, it was a little disappointing that way. We just weren't able to shoot everything that we wanted to shoot. It's Ray's movie, and Judy Ridley, for, her name was Ridley then, and was, you know, for, was in Night of the Living Dead. And I think the, the two of them carried the film. Ray was a very strong actor. I think he really could have had a career, a big career, but he chose to stay in Pittsburgh and teach and work at the Pittsburgh Playhouse and, you know, like that. Judy was very, you know, just brought a freshness to it. I mean, not, not an act, never trained as an actress at all. She just had a sort of instinct, a great look, and, and, you know, an instinctive ability to be natural and, you know, just not afraid of the camera. She was able to just relax and, you know, do her thing. We were producing TV commercials and industrial films at the time. We had the studio and the cameras and the lights and everything, so we set the film in that milieu. And Rudy's cousin, Richard, who plays the producer, Richard Ritchie, we call him the Rev. He's, he was around on many, many films all the way through Night Riders that we worked on. He actually was a, a TV commercial producer who had, went on and had a big career in New York and so forth, and then finally just got on a motorcycle and left the world, took off. You know, it was just our world. It was what we were doing then, and so we thought that was a good setting for this. We shot the film over months and months, and we, we would pick up the cameras and go and shoot a little bit and then shoot a little bit whenever we had time between jobs. And then we'd wait for Rudy to write, you know, some more, another scene or uh, some, get some more script pages from him. And so it was really spread out. It was kind of scattered. And I don't think any of us were very comfortable or happy with the way it turned out. So I don't think of it as um, uh, stylistically mine. I mean, I, I think that maybe what I had to do in the end was go back in and try to edit it and use the narration. And I used like these little stylistic tricks to try to make it all glue together and play. I don't think of uh, There's Always Vanilla as a film that I, that, that I directed as much as a film that I edited. I wasn't even at some of the screenings when we first brought it to look for distribution. And we finally uh, showed it to Canvas Films. They had been doing, you know, sort of softcore porn stuff, and they wanted to upgrade their image, and they they picked it up as distributor. 
called it the affair. 